Hello and welcome back to Multimoda. I'm your host, Baxi Future. Today is a very special edition of the podcast. Why is it a special edition of the podcast? Dropping on a Thursday, which the podcast never does. Well, today's a very special day. And the reason it's a special day is because OpenAI has announced that GPT-3 is now available to the public. What does this mean? This means you can go on the OpenAI website, sign up for an account, and start using GPT-3 instantly. This is something that power users like myself of GPT-3 have been waiting for for almost a year and a half now. Uh, and to be honest, as a user, it's it's mind-blowing as an experience that you can just sign up and get access to a state-of-the-art, large-scale language model instantly. In today's podcast, I will be talking about my personal journey with GPT-3 and this journey to get here that now that it's available publicly for access, I'll talk about why I'm excited about access, share some of the details about why I've sort of really advocated for greater access in the GPT-3 community, why I think GPT-3 access is important, and I'll also be talking about where things could go uh, now that GPT-3 is open to the public. What does this mean for existing users as well as new users who are joining? And I will be making two predictions next for, for what will happen by the end of the year or maybe early next year now that the community will, will likely grow. So to start with, so my journey with GPT-3. So I got to try GPT-3 in summer 2020, roughly two to three weeks or a month after it came out. And before that, I had tried it indirectly through all these apps that run on top of GPT-3. So the first was Philosopher AI. Uh, then there was another app. I, I forgot its name, but it basically would allow you to interview really famous people with GPT-3 pretending to be really famous people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. And at the time, like I remember I was on the hunt for advancements in AI or NLP that were significant, like not just a cool research paper with a 4% improvement in MNIST or something like that, right? Like something significant. Um, and so when I had tried these apps indirectly, like Philosopher AI or the interviewing one, I was so blown away as a user that a single model could do all these things, right? Like I was just shocked that you know, its ability to pretend to be Elon Musk and use language like Elon Musk would use, you know, communicate in his style. At one point, like it was like I was asking like Elon Musk for life advice, right? And it was just shocking. It was it would respond in the way that Elon would respond. Like you have to think in first principles, <laughs> right? Stuff like that. And I thought that this kind of a response from an AI model was honestly years away, like maybe, maybe a decade, right? And it was there today. And so I remember thinking I have to get access to GPT-3. And at the time I didn't know that you need to actually apply for access and there's a whole process and blah, 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 blah. And so what ended up happening is I did get access through a lot of clever maneuvering and uh, be asking really nicely and those kinds of things. And uh, I even made a, a video uh, on it, like first sharing cool GPT-3 use cases because I was so excited and then making another video sharing with everyone else on how they could get access to GPT-3. And I shared my exact process for doing that. And so once I got personal access, I was just blown away that you can type all these things and get responses. I was blown away that GPT-3 can communicate in multiple languages. I was blown away that it, it doesn't get thrown off by misspellings. If you misspell a word, it gets it. it. It's like it's not bothered that you misspelled it. It still knows what you mean. I was like blown away that it could do all these things, like whether it's write a poem or whether it's uh, you know, tokenized text, which is a video that I made. It was just shocking. And it was just shocking because honestly, I thought this stuff was five years away. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. And so, uh, from then on, I guess the rest is history, right? Like I, I made all these videos on GPT-3 use cases. I became more active in the community on Slack and eventually the community forums. I found all these use cases of my own. My favorite use case is still generating press releases with GPT-3. I encourage you to watch that video if you haven't seen it. And I think it's very exemplary of the potential and power of GPT-3 in the way that you can just give a headline and watch it write all of this press release for you, which often does demonstrate some coherency, some creativity, some kind of general world knowledge and all these other things. And so 
I even remember thinking that, you know, is perhaps GPT-3 a very primitive AGI? If you don't know what AGI means, it stands for Artificial General Intelligence. It's like this dream of AI that it could be, you know, like, you know, some, like, like imagine like it's something you'd see in a movie where you could just talk to it. And so I'm not going to be having that debate here with you today is, is GPT-3 AGI? Um, that is like the easiest way. <laughs> to start a, a war in the comments with the very highly academic side on one side and then perhaps the users and people who are more open-minded on the other and everybody just goes at each other. So we're not going to be doing that today. But I, all I'm saying is, regardless of my own opinion, GPT-3 was the first thing to me that felt like, wow, like this this is maybe a primitive or it could be a, a very primitive form of AGI. Perhaps history will look back at, at this moment as, as exactly that. And so, um, for me, the magic became like, this is an incredible language model. This is an incredible product. I was playing with it all the time, you know, getting it to write lyrics. I was asking it for, for life advice. You know, a lot of people who have GPT-3 in the beginning start just, you know, almost using it as a therapist, right? Like, here's what I'm going through. Here's what I'm thinking to do tomorrow. What are your thoughts? Right. And so, uh, for me, it's almost a life experience getting access to GPT-3. And I also believe because it can write books for you, because it can, you know, help you make decisions, because, uh, it can help you come up, like in my case, with YouTube ideas and help you write your YouTube scripts. I not only think GPT-3 is a life experience, but I also think it's, it's, it's a, it's a very good, uh, you know, an economic utility, right? In, in the right hands and productive hands. Uh, GPT-3 can actually really benefit productive people and make them more productive. It can maybe help with economic outcomes, right? Uh, you know, you may not speak the language, but perhaps through a, f a future version of GPT-3, you can describe your book and it will write it for you in, in, in a language like English, which is, you know, more easily wider uh, distributable. And so anyway, so in a nutshell, like that was my experience with GPT-3. And a little bit, I've sort of dabbled at the end of why I think GPT-3 is important for economic equality, as well as just a life experience. Most people will not get a chance to talk to Elon Musk in their lifetime. However, most people may be given a chance to, to speak to GPT-3 imitating Elon Musk. And to me, that's just a cool life experience. Like, you know, riding a, you know, taking a roller coaster at a, you know, famous amusement park like Disney World or something like that, right? Like, I think there's a fun in it. There's a joy in it. I think everyone should should be able to try it for themselves and use this tool um, in ways that are productive, that could benefit them and equalize economic outcomes. And so that's also, so that's my experience. That's why I thought it was important. And so along the way, I had sort of been advocating for access a fair amount like you know so my problem at the time was fine there's a waiting list right you have to apply for the waiting list my problem at the time was opening eye just wasn't doing a good job managing the waiting list and one thing that really sort of bothered me at some level is why was i making the video on how to get access why was i the one to do it that should have been coming from them right and at the same time, like filling out the application form was not straightforward, especially if English was not your first language. Um, I felt like it was nowhere near the level that it that it needed to be. And in that way, it wasn't good. It wasn't fair. And so uh, what's cool is, you know, I, I chatted with them. We talked about it. There were some improvements since then to the application form. And in the end, they ended up doing the absolute right thing in a way for, for access to GPT-3 by making it public which is what they did today. And so for someone like me, who's really been advocating for access in the community, pushing against things like the wait list, uh, it's just really rewarding to see. I think all of this stuff is really exciting because the joy that I felt trying GPT-3 and using it and becoming a fan for life, uh, I feel like is now distributed, right? Potentially millions of people will will share this joy that, that I feel for GPT-3. And uh, just knowing that it's going wider and further is an amazing feeling. And so uh, anyways, so I think, you know, it will be a enjoyable experience. I think it will make people more productive. And I'm also excited for diverse people, perhaps people who are non-technical to get access to GPT-3 because I think they will discover new use cases. 
uh, the community at a bigger scale, I think it's inevitable. People will discover new use cases. People will make interesting things with it that nobody else in the community has thought of up to this point. I always feel like GPT-3 is just a few use cases away from going supernova, right? And so I think those new use cases will likely come from people who just joined the community and have fresh eyes. And so uh, it's important for us to have new people with diverse perspectives, new people with fresh eyes, with a different background. Uh, one of my criticisms of the community is we tend to be very highly technical. I, I've been saying for, for months now, I'm excited for artists to have access to GPT-3 and the things they'll do with it and the ideas and concepts they'll come up with. And we may start to see that over the next few months. And so uh, getting close to the end here, I, I guess I'll just wrap up with some of my predictions uh, about the announcement. So what does GPT-3 being publicly available mean? So... My first prediction is I think more people will start signing up to the OpenAI beta uh, and creating like multiple emails and multiple accounts when they run out of credits. <laughs> so it will almost be like a Netflix kind of deal uh, where, you know, like, you know, when you're a student or something like that, like you just sort of get by by creating these free accounts. Um, so I think that's going to be funny to see. And, and obviously, uh, you know, perhaps OpenAI will add more tokens eventually. Uh, to, to the default number, uh, to the default number of tokens per account for, for new accounts. I think that'd be a pretty good thing. But also I, I think they're aware and it's probably really funny from their end, uh, that, you know, there's that point where you run out of tokens and you're like, man, I just, I really need like, you know, 10,000 more something, right? Cause I want to continue using GPT-3, right? And so. My first prediction is that, that it may become like a Netflix-like service where people have multiple identities, multiple accounts that they just keep renewing <laughs> with a different email so that they could keep going. Uh, my second prediction, which is more significant, I'll be honest. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption. Just a quick editor's note. Before I get to my next prediction, I want to remind you the OpenAI Terms of Usage Agreement, Terms of Service Agreement, clearly states you must be 18 years or older in order to use GPT-3 and the OpenAI platform. I don't know when this rule was announced or if it's a new thing, but I just want to make that clear uh, going forward for the rest of the podcast for the second prediction that you keep this in mind. This is the agreement that you're you're getting into with OpenAI, and this is the expectation. I hope you follow the rules outlined in the terms of service agreement. Uh, I was going to cut the rest of this podcast, cut the second prediction out, but this is just not that podcast. This is an unedited podcast. It's always raw, single take. And so I've left the rest of this podcast there, the second prediction. At this point, it's probably wrong. But I, I thought just to preserve that rawness and not editorialize it, I'm leaving it in there. Uh, please keep it in mind. You must be 18 years above in order to use GPT-3 and the OpenAI platform. Thank you. Back to the show. Um, I think we'll start seeing people in high school uh, using GPT-3. I think we'll start seeing that base growing. Um, I think if you talk to an average high schooler, they are they, in the past, they, they would not be down to fill out the wait list and sign up for GPT-3. Uh, it's like way too much work for somebody at that age. <laughs> but I can see them using it perhaps with homework, perhaps with essays, perhaps maybe even making life decisions, perhaps creating fun bots that they, you know, uh, unleash on their friends and seeing what happens. Um, and so I, I think high schoolers and that age, perhaps middle schoolers will start using GPT-3. And so what does this mean for education? Uh, what does this mean for English class where half the essays are generated? Uh, perhaps by GPT-3? Well, I think it raises important questions about the nature of education. Um, this has been a debate that I, I think is you know, very, very common and something very active right now. If you thought calculators were bad, wait till you see GPT-3 and perhaps math GPT-3, which was the research paper which came out a week or two ago. It's a specialized version of GPT-3 that can do you know, middle school, elementary school level math. And so... Uh, my personal take on it is uh, I think uh, what will happen is with AI-aided tools, I think it will just be harder to get higher marks. I think students may actually start to compete not just on writing an essay that fits the format the teacher describes, but perhaps writing the best essay, writing something that could be published uh, somewhere formally or as a book with deep ideas that they're passionate about. Um, I think the bar will just go up higher. And... Uh, 
perhaps it's time to rethink these things like grades. Perhaps it's time, like, you know, it's so hard for people who are in high school right now to get into engineering harder than it's ever been. Why? Right. If, if the, if the, if the number of seats is the only limitation, let's, let's 10 X the seats. Right. I, I think it's, it is time for education to, uh, you know, sort of remove the veil, open up and understand that the times are different. Uh, just because you can follow an essay format does not mean you deserve a prize or a medal. Uh, I think, I think it's important, you know, but I, I think mastery over essays is, is probably more deserving of a, of a good grade, right? Than just simply being able to follow the format like the teacher prescribed. And so anyways, yeah, there are significant implications for high schoolers getting access, but I think we will see a large growth, uh, from that age group and, uh, the question of academic plagiarism, the question of, you know, student life going forward. These are important questions. The plagiarism thing is a little bit hard because personally, I've Googled a lot of the times, whatever Google generates, whatever open, whatever GPT-3 generates for me, I've Googled it and looked it up. And Google has no record that anything like that has ever been said. That's my experience. So what I'm finding is most of what GPT-3 says is unique. So I don't know if you run it through any plagiarism direct, uh, detector, and I think other people have, if any results will even come up. So it's almost like they're, I, I don't know what the teachers will do if they're going to enforce plagiarism, if they don't want AI-based writing tools. I don't know what they're going to do, right? But I think the right thing to do is to lean inward and ask fundamental questions about the nature of education. Maybe it is time we start questioning the status quo. This thing has been a long time coming right? Math, English, all these core subjects, um, and universities as well, right? I mean, I think that's, that is an institution that needs to be gutted, right? I mean, it's very hard to say that. I, I may get in trouble for saying that. I mean, that's my opinion, but anyway, so what's the point of this? I guess my two predictions are number one, GPT-3 OpenAI may become a Netflix like service where people are creating all these accounts to get access, get more tokens. And then my other prediction is I think we'll see more high schoolers join over the next six months uh, to a year. Uh, that's that's my immediate. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm, I am I guess the last piece is I'm just excited to see the GPT-3 OpenAI community grow. I can't imagine what number we'll be at this time next year. Maybe it's worth following up uh, a year from now. How much growth did we see? What use cases? You know, what is the representation of the community? I'd be interested in numbers around you know, uh, the diversity and those kinds of things. So anyways, today's a very exciting day. We are at the beginning of something much, much bigger. Uh, uh, we are, we are, we have always just been scratching the surface with the opening eye beta. Now that we are out of beta, I think we'll, we'll truly see all the things that GPT-3 is capable of. And that's exciting for everybody involved. So anyways, uh, that's the end of today's podcast. If you don't know, so I have a YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash B-A-K-Z-T future. It is the largest YouTube channel in the world on OpenAI, GPT-3, multimodal AI models like DALI. I have this podcast called Multimodal by Baxter Future. You can find it everywhere. Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. I use Pocket Cast. You can find it on there. I have this really fun newsletter, B-A-K-Z-T future.substack.com. This is where I ask important questions about GPT-3 and multimodal stuff. I share the latest news. I share different, you know, essays and different thoughts I have on, on bigger things about where things are going. And you can also find me on Twitter at B-A-K-Z-T future. I'm having fun on Twitter. Sometimes I'm ranting wildly, tweeting wildly, um, and, uh, you know, sharing just the latest, uh, a, a GPT-3 AI news, anything relevant to a member of the community I, I share on my personal Twitter. So anyways, that's it for today's podcast. I want to welcome all the new faces. I, I hope you have as much fun with GPT-3 as I have always had. And I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good one. Bye.